Amen. Amen. We let that glorious moment of silence, which is a rarity in my household, to be answered with an amen. Amen indeed. Glorious Lord, we thank You for this day, for what You've given us, for the hope that You present each of us in our lives, for the grace and the forgiveness You pour down upon us, that we could receive it today. Receive it and put it deeply into our hearts and our very souls, that we would know personally of Your love for us, that we would see that love expressed throughout the church in our relationships with all of God's people. Let us now begin this day with our call to worship. Join me now in the uh, responsive call to worship. Come to worship this day. Bring with you all your joys and sorrows. Jesus will offer hope. Come to worship this day believing in the power of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus will bring healing. Come to worship this day feeling the presence of God. Jesus will teach us new ways to live. Amen. And we continue our worship now with the hymn, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Skies.
bones will sing Great are you understood that note. <laughs> this morning's scripture reading comes from Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 20. The Lord is your God will raise you up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Arab. On the day of the assembly when he said, you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command you. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. Will you join me now in the unison response of prayer? Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused us wonders to remember. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. The Lord provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. The Lord has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. The Lord provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen. Amen. We take this opportunity now, because we are not able to hug and to kiss and to grab one another, instead we offer a holy wave and a word of peace. And so now I offer, peace be with you. Turn to a neighbor and wish them the peace of God. Peace be with you and also with you. Amen and amen. Amen. Uh, I have a little introduction to my prayer this morning. <coughs> uh, 
this hymn has been going around in my head all week. And uh, when I saw the uh, order of worship and saw that I had to uh, have the prayer this morning, for some reason there's a couple of verses here that even though this hymn, which is essentially a prayer, is uh, generally used at evening services, I think the words will have meaning this morning too. We had <clears throat> joined me in prayer. Dear Lord, abide with me. Fast fall the eventide. The darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. When others' helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless. Oh, abide with me. I need thy presence every passing hour. What but thy dim, what, what by thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Who like thyself my guide and stay can be through cloud and sunshine? Oh, abide with me. Lord, we can never forget all those who have given so much of their time, their skills, their love, and some even their lives to provide care for those infected with, your, with COVID. We are truly thankful to them for all they have done and will continue to do so far as long as only you know. But this morning, we especially direct our praise and thanksgiving to you, our God, the three in one, the Father, creator of all there is, both heaven and earth, the Alpha and Omega. Thank you, Lord. The Son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to earth to teach and heal, but ultimately to sacrifice himself on the cross for the forgiveness of our sin. Thank you, Jesus. Even when his task was finished, you did not desert us. You sent the Holy Spirit as a guide, our comforter, and our helper. Thank you, Father. All too often we fail to sense the presence of your spirit within us or even around us. But then what, do, what we do not seek, we cannot find. Dear God, help us this day to say, Holy Spirit, enter into my life. Find a place in my heart and mind. Cast out my demons, calm my anxieties and fears. Grant me the peace and comfort I seek. Help me live the life I am meant to live. We also ask, Father, that your spirit would move throughout this church and this congregation, washing away our fears and uncertainties for the future. Help us to rely on your spirit to guide us on the path you would have us follow. We seek the strength and the courage to once again open wide the purple doors, not to let the light in, but to let our light shine outward, your light into the community in which this church has stood for over 200 years. Thank you, Father. Lord, we ask now that you hear the silent prayers of each of our hearts. Hear us now, dear God, as we pray the prayer Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> this again is the time for us to consider how we may serve the Lord in our time, our talent, our treasures. Yet it must be understood that so many of us are weary in this time of COVID 
where we feel we have given perhaps all that we have. Perhaps many of us feel even a little empty. And so wonder, Lord, what it is we can offer in return, what it is we can turn back to your glory. But as we sang this morning, it is the very air that we breathe that belongs to God. It is the thankfulness we must all have in knowing that the Lord cares for us and knows what we are going through. And even though we may feel despairing or distraught, anxious, or even riddled with fear, God is here with us. And so now is a good time, perhaps, in the midst of that thought, to consider what I can do to serve God, to serve God's kingdom to serve God's church, to serve God's people in any way possible. Well, we can always give our tithes, our financial gifts. Those are readily accepted in a church that sometimes is struggling. But perhaps most of all, we need each other's prayers. We need prayers as much as we need hugs. And while we cannot hug, we can pray. And so I invite each and everyone to pray a hug upon their neighbor A deep and loving hug that perhaps can nurture them and fill their ear with words of praise and encouragement. As we lift our voices to thank God for life itself, remind yourself as well that God praises the day you were born and also sings joyous, prayerful adorations over you. Let us now join in our doxology. Amen indeed. Please be seated. Let yourself be carried away, transformed as it were. Let your prayers grow deeper still as we take this moment of interlude.
Hear now the New Testament reading this morning from Mark 1, 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as no one, as one who had authority and not as the teachers of law. Just then a man in their synagogue there who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want from us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people are all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives order to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey, do I have any children today? I bet I do. One, little, two. There's two. There's three. Oh, wait, that's dad. <laughs> Amen. This is an altar call. Hey, boys, how you doing? How you doing? What's going on? How are you today? Are you good? Yeah, everything all right? What's, your, what's that, Scooby-Doo on your mask? I like that. What you got? You got? Are you a bear? Are you, roar, a bear. Awesome. I thought it was a teddy bear, like nice bear. Are you nice bear? Are you? I have, yeah, mine's just red. It's just boring. It's just red. But you like it? Well, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. I like your snow boots. Now we've had our mutual admiration society. Roar, yes. Hey, what is what good thing happened to you this week? Anything good happen? You got a note from your teacher. That's sometimes not a good thing. Why is that a good thing? <laughs> I know when I get a note from the teacher, it's like, uh-oh, open this one slowly, right? Was it good? I got a good report. You did? Congratulations. I'd high-five you. Air high-five. There we go. Awesome. A good report. How about you, buddy? Anything good happened today? You had your check. You went to the doctor? Yeah. It's funny what Dad thinks is a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. Did you do well? Yeah, are you getting bigger and bigger and bigger? You got a sticker. Awesome. That's a great thing. That's a great thing. So, what should we do today? Should we pray for somebody? Do you know anyone who needs some prayer? Yeah? Okay. And Poppy? Nani and Poppy need prayer? Who else? Why do they need prayer? They not feeling good? You don't have to give me the details. That's okay. But you know what? There's a lot of people here that aren't... You, oh, say that again? Yes? Okay. He said yes. All right. There's a lot of people that are having a hard time this week, you know? Everybody's kind of scared about this COVID thing, right? Do you, see, do you know people who are a little worried about it? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh-oh, uh-oh, well, you know, out of the mouths of babes, hey? Hey, you know, it's okay, because what we have here in the Bible is the promise of God that if we love God, God will take care of us. And at the end of everything, when we get really, really old, God will take us home, and we'll be okay. So we have that faith and that hope that even if it gets bad, it'll actually end up good. So isn't that a nice thing to think about? How about we pray for everybody who might be sick today? Would you do that with me? Loving Lord Jesus, we know these are hard times for some people. Some of us are worried for ourselves. Some of us are worried for our nani, our poppy, and for all the people we know. Lord, we ask that you would heal them that you would tell them you love them, that you would remind them how special they are in your eyes, and that you would help us, Lord, to also know that you love us. You love us because we are special in your eyes. 
And if there's anything we can live into today, it's the, no, the knowledge that you love us and we love you right back. So we pray this today in Jesus' name. And we say, Amen. 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 Go be a bear for Christ, okay? Grr. All right, thank you. Thank you. What an interesting time. A time in history that many of us will remember. I heard a song the other day, and I, I didn't know how I felt about it. It was kind of poppy, and my daughter made me listen to it. But it basically said, we will laugh about this one day. And I thought, boy, I hope that's true. Because right now, <laughs> not a lot of us are laughing. <laughs> but we have that hope, right? We have that hope that we will someday be able to look back and say, we were there, we remember it, and you know, we got through it, and it wasn't the best, but it wasn't the worst. And so let's, let's pray for laughter today, that we would learn to laugh and learn to love. In our text today, Jesus shows us, actually Jesus moves from simply calling us into discipleship, but showing us how to live into that discipleship and what to do. We heard from Deuteronomy this morning that God will raise up a prophet from among the people. And such a prophet is one that we must listen to. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. And anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in the name, in my name, a word that I have not commanded, that prophet shall die. Seemingly harsh words from Deuteronomy, but reminding us that God has given us a prophet. His very own Son, acknowledged by many at least as a prophet and by us as our Messiah, our Lord, and our Savior, speaks in God's name for us to hear. And we are held accountable for what we hear and how we respond to that. Prophets are often raised up throughout history. Many faith traditions have prophets that emerge that speak God's Word with the power of God. Some... Truly with that power, others because they wish to be that power. And in Deuteronomy, the people wanted prophets in that day. They wanted a new Moses to come out. But perhaps they wanted someone to simply do everything for them. Someone who would, like Moses, talk to God so they wouldn't have to encounter God themselves. You might recall that from all of the tales of Exodus. Moses going in to wrangle with God and the people saying, no, no, that's, that's for you to do. And the people were passive in that. But this Gospel of Mark refers to Jesus frequently as a teacher and a rabbi, as a prophet and a priest, as it were. And if we pay attention to it, Jesus' teaching is always action-oriented. And all of Mark seems to confirm Christ's authority. The people said to Moses in the day of Deuteronomy, you go talk to God and tell us what He says and then we'll decide how to respond to that. But Jesus said, I'm God, I'm right here, I'm talking right to you. So respond to me now, in the moment, as I give you God's Word. And that Word also is to go and to do and to be. You see, we're in a period of the church where I'm maybe moving us from being followers of Jesus, passive hearers of the Word, into being disciples of Jesus. And I know that's a painful transition for many, but it's one that goes from simply enjoying and observing the teaching of God's Word into putting it within us and enacting it in our everyday life. And by being a disciple of Jesus, we don't expect someone else to hear from God and tell us. We expect to encounter God directly in our own life. 
to hear the words of Christ in our heart that challenge us to not simply be a hearer of the Word, but be a doer of the Word. And by being a disciple of Christ, there's a lot involved in that because we can now call upon God personally in our prayer life. We can call upon God's very power within our life. We can call upon God to be present, standing alongside of us while we go through life. And we can learn to hear the voice of God ourselves without interpretation. Without someone streaming it down to us and filtering it and giving us little portions. Because that's what Deuteronomy was saying. Hear the prophet who speaks my word, not the prophet who gives you what they want to share. But in order to get over that, we need to hear directly from God. Deuteronomy, the people wanted again someone else to do it for us. You be that person that talks to God. But to be a disciple is to be expectant. To be made like the Master. To be a student of the Master. John 14, verse 12 told us about this. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you that one who believes in Me will also do the works that I do. And, oh, there we go, and, right? It's not a but, it's an and. And, in fact, will do greater works than these. Because I am going to the Father. That's a Scripture we hear often, very often listed out in funerals. John 14. But it's a Scripture that doesn't speak to death. It's a Scripture that speaks to life. That we who believe will do the things that Christ has done and more and greater things. Where are we then in that journey? If we are to do greater things than Christ because we believe, do we really expect someone else to do it for us? And we cheer them on from a distance? Go, go, you do that. I'm going home. In my case, as the pastor of the church, are you counting on me to make sure the church connects with God? Are you counting on me to save your soul and to keep you in God's mind? Oh Lord, I hope not. I hope you're developing a relationship with God where you can talk to God yourself. And we can pray together to talk to God to figure out what our life should be. Because if you knew how many things I forgot in every given day, you'd be fearful for your soul if you thought it was up to me. See, I'm a human being. I think we all are, right? Any any aliens in the room? No, that's okay. Good. Don't answer that. I don't want to know. But as people, we're prone to failure. And sometimes we'd rather have someone do it for us so we don't have to worry about our inability. The prophet is not called to do it for you. They are called to help you to remember to do it for Jesus and for yourself. Everything. Everything about your life devoted to God. The very breath we breathe as we sang this morning. That comes down to the basic elements of life. Your very heart beats. Well, it beats for me, Pastor. I need the blood to flow. Yes, but it beats for God. And God causes it to continue to beat within you. See, it's easy to fall victim to good time Gospels, right? We've all seen this in the history of the church. Not this one. All the church throughout time. That people come... And they proclaim a word and a faith and a, 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 an ability to say, hey, it's me, I'm the one who will talk to God for you and I can give you blessings and maybe you can name this and claim that and prosperity is for you. We see all this stuff. And many of them are taken to be false prophets, but it's easy to fall victim. Except when our bank accounts are emptied and our prayers are not answered and our hopes are dashed and we realize we were talking to a person and not to God. A true prophet speaks truth to the power and authority of this world. A true prophet stands up for God and delivers people from bondage and oppression. And that's not just a physical bondage and oppression. That's a spiritual bondage. Helps to free them from the things that hold them back. 
Everything from racial fairness to the physical slavery to addictions to sexual deviance to poverty to sin, everything that oppresses and hinders God's will, the prophet speaks truth to that and brings power to that, shines a light on that so we can say, is that fitting in the life I want to live? Is that where I truly think God wants me to be? Now the next step in claiming that power in Christ is to realize that if Jesus said, you shall do greater things than me, that there's truth in that, and there are ministries we shy from that we are able to step into with God, not on ourselves, not because we want to, not because we think we have to, but because God leads each of us in our individual gifts into specific ministries. Those may be prophecy, healing, or even exorcism. Whoa, the pastor just went off the crazy train. Uh-oh. But what are we dealing with today in the Gospel of Mark? We're dealing with demonic possession. Not common in most churches, right? We don't expect to have this conversation. We hopefully don't have demons popping up in the pews or up front. That's okay. And when we hear those words, we might laugh to ourselves or scream, if you were, at movies that we've encountered over time like The Exorcist and all that entertainment that we look at to be shocked, excited, whatever the case may be. Or the numbers of tales throughout history of demons and evil spirits, and we say, well, that's not true. I, I comfortably laugh at that. You know, whistling through the graveyard kind of thing. I can laugh at that. I can make fun of that because I don't see it in the real world. How often do we make fun of the things we don't understand? How often do we fail to really find out who someone is, but instead we simply pick on a character trait because we don't get it or it seems funny to us. It's comfortable to laugh in the face of misunderstanding, but it gives us only a false sense of control. We don't really have control on the situation. So when I tell you Satan moves through this world in power and might, you can say, oh, that's funny. (laughs) Please don't be true. But 1 Peter reminds us, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, discipline yourselves. You could stop right there. There's a whole message. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert like a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith. I I haven't used that word this week. Anyone use the word steadfast? It's a tough one. Be strong. Stand firm. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith. For you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. I can testify to this. I was called on mission trip in 2008. That's where I received my calling into ministry. Another story. But I witnessed communities of faith that actively experienced demonic possession within their congregation and would practice prayerful exorcisms in the moment to free the spirit, the individual, from what has controlled them. Now, we can have a long discussion about psychology, cultural significance, all kinds of things. But in the heart of a place like Uganda, this is real stuff. And my experience there led me to believe That it's real everywhere, but we've just blinded ourselves to it. We we label it differently. Well, eh, it's just that. It's not really something that serious. It's just this, something less important, some emotional thing. But the enemy is present in this world. I stand firm on that. Scripture tells us that. Now the enemy not exists as some great scaly winged beast from some Renaissance Italian painting or necessarily as a roaring lion as 1 Peter describes, a physical lion in the room. 
And maybe the enemy is not present in any form we would recognize whatsoever. Maybe the enemy moves silently through people at key moments, initiating his will, steering the situation his way. That's a scary thought. To imagine that an evil spirit would take a turn in you for a time when your guard was down. But think of this, how many stories have we heard of people who, say, did something against their will, contrary to their normal behavior. They were compelled to do something bad, and later they said, well, I didn't know, I felt like I wasn't myself, I was doing something, I I acted out, I wasn't thinking. And when it ended, they felt like it was something else, someone other than them behaving in that moment, like they just woke from a bad dream. Many of us can understand the sudden savage rage that can rise within us at times if we're greatly offended. The anger that suddenly seems to get out of control, that we have to talk ourselves down from. Seemingly out of nowhere, we had to resist an impulse within ourselves. And it took all of our will to just stifle that and to sit down. You see, possessions are more common and subtle than we may have ever believed. Pastor's in crazy town. You like that? He's gone off the hook. But this is all biblical interpretation of human behavior. Now Joyce Meyer, not one I necessarily advocate, but I believe everyone has one good book in them. Joyce Meyer in her book, Battlefield of the Mind, says that all thoughts come from three sources. The self, God, or the spirit, or the devil. Now that's kind of an ego id, super ego kind of thing if you think about it. That in any instance, we may be inspired by our own selves or tempted in a heavenly or a hellish manner. She goes on to say, and I'm not advocating this, but it's interesting, that the thoughts that are your own are less than you like to believe. That inspirations, divine moments of epiphany, where you figure a problem out, is not necessarily you as much as God helping you out. And that your own thoughts tend to be, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I've got to go to the bathroom, my back hurts, wow, it's cold in here. And they're all about our bodies and our experience, our interaction with our direct environment. I just lay that out before you to see a, a somewhat modern construct of a possession. Jesus calls out sin throughout Scripture in all forms, not just the abnormal or the mentally deranged, because they're not the worst danger. The most obvious offensive behavior is easy to spot and easy to avoid, but it's telling in the Gospel of Mark that it comes from someone who's well-placed within the temple. What? Yes. In verse 23, just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's an interesting thought. That in a holy place, the enemy would have a foothold. Jesus calls out all sin, And in many cases, he calls out people that appear to be fine to the rest of us, but inwardly are harboring some behavior that causes them to act out. Maybe maybe it's greed. Maybe they have hate issues. Maybe they're power hungry. They're malicious. Maybe they're slanderers. Maybe they're gossips or backbiters or bullies. Maybe they're abusers, liars, homewreckers, adulterers, thieves, fakes, on and on and on. All understandable, knowable human behavior that each of us has experienced and individuals we know. And Jesus calls all of that into question. So when he speaks of evil, it's not just the grand, divine, splitting the walls, demons rising from the floor evil. He's talking about everyday bad behavior. Because all possessions are manifestations of behaviors that cause disruption among the gathered community. Let me give that to you again. All possessions are manifestations of behaviors that cause disruption among the gathered community. 
troublemakers, you might say. And there are as many in the church as there are in society as a large. They are the unclean spirits that dwell within the church and within our culture. Those spirits that strive to create disruptive challenges, preventing the work of Christ from being carried out. Some may object to a particular new ministry. Some may object to a certain behavior, a pattern of worship. Some may seek to comfort the established. Others may just simply want to keep it as it was, including their own status, position, and power, without ever thinking, where might God be calling us to go and what to do? The Pharisees and scribes and Mark themselves said, what is this new teaching? But there's another side to their lack of belief in Christ's teaching. Their problem was their devotion to their own traditional forms of power. Their tradition, as they interpreted through Scripture, was that they had an elevated place equal to or trumping the Scriptural Word. And Jesus comes in and says, no, we're not to be bound by human-made rules. We're to be bound to Christ's Spirit and to God's will for the future of our lives. And the church, this is the difference from a Christ follower to a disciple. But the concerns for the, past, the personal status becomes wrapped into their understanding of God working. They like to walk around in log robes and get greetings in the marketplaces and take the best seats in synagogues and the best places at feasts. Mark 12, 38 through 39. And they perceive Jesus' popularity in this case as a threat. And so uprises a possession in the congregation to challenge Who are you? Come here to destroy us. You see, the integrity starts to fall apart. Because Jesus says these same people who rise up are those who devour widows' houses and take money from those who are without and for a pretext make long prayers for their own edification. And they expect to receive a greater reward when Christ actually promises them they will receive a greater condemnation. Mark 12, verse 40. They shut their eyes to which they don't want to see. Leonardo da Vinci said that there are three classes of people. Those who see, those who see what they are shown, and those who do not see. Interesting. Interesting. The scribes and the Pharisees belong to this third class. By personal choice, they do not want to see. And Jesus calls them out and dismisses them. Their time has come. Their place is gone. When Jesus commissions the twelve, He says He will grant them the authority to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons, 3.15, and unclean spirits, Mark 6.7, that they will do so. That they will preach with authority of a prophet and offer the true words of God, the very words that God has placed upon their heart. And that they will continue to do so no matter how it is received. Psalm 116 tells us, I kept my faith even when I said I am greatly afflicted. You see, the point is not us. The point is God. As a disciple, we're not just followers. We're not camp followers. We're disciples. We're students. We're trainees, if you will. And we're called about to seek to free others and ourselves from whatever keeps us from experiencing real joy, community, and purpose. Because God wills those things into our life. Real joy. Not just happiness. Community. Loving, bonded community. And a purpose. A vision. A mission. A goal. And that is what God wills for us. We get to experience something glorious today. Something that has brought joy to my week. So just like any of us, we suffer from depression and anxiety and worry and doubt. And occasionally God speaks into our lives and brings joy and brings purpose 
and shows us why we're here. And today is one of those days. We're going to see why we are here. To free the oppressed. To make disciples of all people in all nations. And to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. quickly get my mask on. This fine lady approached me a few weeks ago feeling a call to faith. I don't mean to embarrass her. But as we had conversation, we studied God's Word, we dug into it, as purpose revealed itself, she realized she needed to be a part of the body of Christ. And so she comes to us today to receive a baptism. And also to come and be a member of this community. I give you this, you may get wet. We recognize a variety of traditions for baptism allowable within the United Methodist Church, but as we decided not to go to the lake because it's cold, that we would practice something here today. You just, no, you just hang on to it in case you get wet. Okay? Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. I present Fatima Araki this day for baptism and for inclusion and membership. I have some questions for you. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. She said, I do, by the way. <laughs> According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful membership of the Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? To you, do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons? Excuse me. And include these persons now before you in your care. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the Scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. It's a lot of words. We'll get through this. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. And I encourage you, if you are willing, to adapt an ancient posture of prayer with your hands lifted as you see fit. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, You swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, You saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, You set in the clouds a rainbow. When You saw Your people as slaves in Egypt, You led them to freedom through the sea. Their children You brought through the Jordan to the land which You promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time You sent Jesus. Nurtured in the water of a womb, He was baptized by John and anointed by Your Spirit. He called His disciples to share in the baptism of His death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare God's work to the nations. His glory among the peoples. Pour out Your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin, to clothe them in righteousness through their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ they may share in His final victory. All praise to You, Eternal Father, through Your Son, Jesus Christ, who with You and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. This is the awkward moment of putting the glove on. You ready? You get wet. Okay. Fatima, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I told her she'd get wet. No. The Holy Spirit begin Your work within You. That in the name of God and by the presence of God, all things may be Yours in Christ's holy kingdom. We pray this blessing upon You. Now it is our joy to welcome our new sister in Christ. If you would read with me. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. As a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service as a witness. I will. Amen. Amen. Members of the household of God, I commend this person to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you and are welcome in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. As a mere token 
I offer you this as a certificate of your baptism for your own life. And here are some forms to fill out <laughs> for, for membership. Let us welcome her in Jesus' name. Amen. This act brings me such joy when I realize it is what we are all about and why we are here. Because of who we are and our traditions, sometimes we're a little wordy about things. But they all mean so much to us. And to a woman who comes to us seeking God, it reminds us that we are here to be that beacon, that point of light, and to cherish Christ and to cherish her as she is now a part of us. I invite you to rise as you are able as we sing, Jesus the Healer, Pass Through Galilee. sickness and suffering today. Heal us, heal us today. We gather together for healing and prayer. Heal us, Lord Jesus. May the blessing of God, fountain of living water, flow within us as a river of life. May we drink deep of her wisdom. May we never thirst again. May we go throughout life refreshing many as a sign of healing for all through the one who is life eternal. Amen. Amen. And now go, let God be with you until we meet again. Jesus, be till 
and praise God and know that you are loved. Be blessed, everyone. Have a great week.